Good afternoon, everyone. I am Rahul Gosain. And I'm Rohit Gosain. And we are Oncology Brothers. We are honored to have a leader, educator, and a clinician in the field of GU malignancy join us today, Dr. Elizabeth Plemack from Fox Chase Cancer Center. With Dr. Plemack, we hope to discuss her approach to treating renal cell cancer and reiterate the current standard of care treatment options. Let us welcome Dr. Plemack. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Plemack. Dr. Plemack, we have divided this current algorithm in localized and advanced metastatic kidney cancer. Can you please start us off with a localized approach and adjuvant treatment options that are available to our patients today? Sure, absolutely. So we are often fortunate that we do detect kidney cancer early, usually as an incidental finding on a scan done for another reason, um, a kidney stone, back pain, something like that. And when we do discover kidney cancer in a resectable state, surgery is the standard of care, partial nephrectomy or complete nephrectomy. And then based on the clinical pathologic characteristics of the tumor at at you know, after surgical removal, we then can assess if the patient is appropriate for adjuvant therapy. Um, we have done many, many adjuvant clinical trials. Most of them have been negative. Um, it's interesting in every class of drugs, there seems to be one that has a little bit of a signal and then is followed quickly by others that don't. That was the case with the TKIs and um, it's the case with the immunotherapy as well. So we do have a standard agent, pembrolizumab, uh, which is FDA approved for adjuvant therapy for high risk renal cell carcinoma after surgery. Um, we do show with that study a disease-free survival benefit. So at the very least, it's delaying recurrence of cancer. What we don't know is if it's preventing cancers from occurring. Uh, in other words, we don't know if we're curing anyone yet with this adjuvant approach. It will likely be many years before we learn that. So when thinking about a patient <clears throat> that you're considering for adjuvant, um, Typically, I, I really do share decision making with the patient. There's no real right answer. Uh, one option is to go ahead with adjuvant therapy. Then we risk over treating patients who are cured anyway. The other is to wait for recurrence. The advantage there is we treat only the patients who need it, but at that point, the disease is typically incurable. The other advantage, though, is we do use in the frontline sort of stronger better therapies than single agent checkpoint, which we're about to talk about. And so there may be some, some advantage because these are quite effective. Dr. Plemek, uh, coming back to this algorithm, any role of neoadjuvant treatment for a patient with locally advanced disease to help them rather downstage and then consider surgical resection? That's a great question, and it's a very practical sort of way to do things, and we do do that sometimes. I think of that, though, as being in the bottom part of this algorithm you're treating localized unresectable disease and trying to then um, get it to a point where it's surgically resectable. The conundrum there is when we get really nice deep responses, we're never quite sure what surgery adds to um, what we've gained with these very effective in many people, not everybody, um, combination therapies that we're about to discuss next. And actually, before we move on, coming back again to IO, in Pembrolizumab, did we see any benefit that was driven because of the high PDL1 score? So, yes, those folks did a little bit better. Um, what's interesting is what drove a lot of the benefit in the overall intent to treat was the M1 NED group. So, there's a group of patients who had metastases that resected, and then those folks got adjuvant. They um, should saw most of the DFS benefit that contributed to the curve. So there is a lot of devil in the details of those data, but ultimately I think we're going to need to see an overall survival benefit. It just may take, you know, a decade to get there. We're watching melanoma very closely. They're ahead of us. They have yet to sort of read out their OS benefit in their PEMBRO adjuvant study. So we'll see. And same thing for lung as well. We have IO approved in adjuvant lung, but we're still waiting on overall survival there right. as well. Right, so we're all looking looking across the disease sites to see who shows it first. Thank you. Uh, now let us dive into the metastatic space where we fortunately have seen explosion of different first line treatment options. Dr. Playmack, can you please walk us through your practice regarding metastatic renal cell cancer? Sure, absolutely. I mean, and you're absolutely right. We have a lot of different options. Um, one of the things that happened in the field is that um, every, you know, we have many different TKIs and many different immunotherapies, and we're kind of combining them every which way, doing large randomized phase three trials. Uh, fortunately, all of them showed benefit. 
Um, so they're all good options. Um, and then we cross compare because we don't have a choice. Uh, I think cross comparison is a little bit more fair here because these drugs, these trials were all done very similarly over a similar period of time. Um, but of course, there are slight differences between them. So one of the things that we always teach our fellows in renal cell carcinoma, there's the IMDC risk criteria. Uh, there are six factors for our lab tests to our clinical characteristics. And we really do use that to have a sense of um, how, how our patient will do in terms of prognosis. It's a very well validated tool. Uh, and what we see that is that favorable risk patients, that phenotype tends to respond really nicely to VEGF TKI therapy. And so you'll see here in the algorithm, all the combinations include a VEGF, either single agent um, or in combination. I think the response rates are better when we are in combination. We believe the long-term outcome are probably better when we use IO upfront. But for favorable risk, I can say I have people with excellent response long-term with TKI alone, um, and they you know, avoid the toxicity of an immunotherapy, that would be an option. We have yet to see a difference in overall survival between the treatment arm and the control arm on any of these studies listed here for combinations and favorable risk. It doesn't mean they're not coming. These patients do very well. So, you know, we expect them to survive for a long time, um, but we'll see if there's ultimate any, ultimately any difference long term. Um, for favorable risk, I tend to go to pembrolizumab, And the reason for that is we predict these folks will be on that treatment for a very long time. Axitinib is both tolerable and titratable with a short half-life. So if you run into problems, it wears off quicker than the others. If someone needs surgery, it wears off quicker before surgery. So it's just a little easier and more nimble of a drug to use. And pembrolizumab, of course, is also very convenient. It's given every six weeks. That's how we give it. <clears throat> um, and so that tends to be what we go to for favorable risk. And how, the list. <laughs> yeah, and how would you approach once we've progressed to second line? Right. So let's go from favorable risk down to the purple box here, second line. It's really dependent on how they did with their first line. So did they experience an immune related adverse event that make you not want to give um, any more immunotherapy? Uh, do you want to continue the immunotherapy and switch out the TKI because of toxicity or tolerability? Um, but if they just had progression uh, quickly on both, I think all the um, options on the list here are reasonable. A common one folks tend to go to after a combination VEGFIO is cabozantinib. It's probably the most powerful single agent TKI on its own. Um, and so when we go to single agent, we tend to use that. Um, the other on the list that has worked really well in certain scenarios is the combination of lenvatinib with everolimus. Now, of course, if you use lenvatinib in the front line, going back to it is probably less appealing. But that's why, again, if you do pembro, axi, cavo, lenev, you're kind of saving your options for later. Not to say that's the only way to go, but that's one way to think about it. Um, again, nivolumab would work if they just had intolerance to the TKI or if that were more of the issue. Uh, and then tavazinib is one we usually leave for later lines, probably not necessarily for good reason, only that the trials tested it in later lines um, and it's a little later on the scene. So that's, uh, we definitely use that. I will say for favorable risk renal cell, it is very common to cycle through multiple options. And I have patients who have, you know, been through every single drug that we're looking at on this list, right? Because they do well, progress a little, and you try something different. Um, so there's a little bit of an art to it once you get beyond frontline, because we don't have studies in the second line that truly reflect our current frontline standard of care. And I think it's also important favorable risk. If patient does not have heavy tumor burden, you have some time to think and pick the right treatment rather than jumping on mm -hmm. uh, saying you need treatment just this very minute. That's true, and I think you do look long-term, which is why we turn to AXI. It's a little gentler, maybe a little lower response rate, but in the favorable risk, they, they almost all respond anyway, and then it's something you can keep on for long-term. One thing I would say, if you're going to start a, a checkpoint inhibitor with a TKI up front, do start them both together. Um, you could do a little lead-in of the TKI, but we see people on single agent for some time and then add a TKI. We just haven't tested that, and if there's true synergy, you're going to want to start both together. Dr. Klimak, given the current data, uh, you mentioned that in favorable, certainly any of these agents do well. How about an intermediate and poor risk category? Now, right. when you talk about you have dual ch checkpoint inhibitors as well as TKI and immunotherapy. Yeah, absolutely. So one hot topic that comes up a lot 
in intermediate and poor risk is do you go with ipi and nevo dual immunotherapy or do you go with one of the checkpoint inhibitor combinations and the argument for dual immunotherapy has always been sort of this durable pfs benefit the issue with that is that that assumption is based on really an incomplete understanding of the data. So the, the study, the IPINIVO phase three study that reports this sort of hanging curve with 30% of patients um, at, at, you know, continued PFS is a little bit misleading because it's censored all the way along. At the five year mark, there's only 10% of patients in that arm even left to be assessed for progression. And all of that censoring is frozen in time because the study has matured beyond that five years, right? Every patient five years has elapsed since they enrolled. And if they're still censored, that means that's data we're never going to see. So I think it's important to understand that the maximum confirmed percent of patients in the ipinevo arm that are progression free at five years is about 11 percent, not 30 percent. And so people will choose that for this sort of long term durable response. Comparing that to the check the checkpoint inhibitor with TKI therapeutics, those combinations, we just haven't gotten to five years yet. But it's absolutely possible, and in my experience, having done these, you know, these types of combinations in much earlier phase, it's very possible that we'll still get to 11% of patients confirmed progression free at that five year mark. Um, but both studies are flawed in that if someone stops therapy or comes off for an immune ad related adverse event, it is almost impossible to fully capture PFS per resist, right? That's only something you can capture when someone's on a study. So these long term results turn out to be really difficult to pin down. The short term results are a lot easier. Those occur when patients are on study. So we know that if you're going for the best overall response rate and the lowest primary progression rate, you're going to pick Len Pembro, right? They have a response rate of 72%. Um, primary progression rate is low at 6%. And so that's your go-to if you're really going for maximum tumor shrinkage. Uh, and all of the other long-term data don't seem to be worse with that combination. We'll, we'll have to see. But that's the biggest debate that we see in this intermediate and poor risk group. These tend to be folks who do need to be treated quickly, who sometimes are symptomatic. Um, and so picking the combination with the best results makes sense. I did recently have a patient that I treated with Nevo Cabo. That was a scenario where the patient was very ill, rapidly progressive disease, hospitalized, and we had to start just with the TKI. So we picked the strongest TKI on the list, which we feel is probably Cabo. Um, and then upon discharge, added nivolumab to that regimen. So there's obviously reasons to use all of these in specific scenarios, but in general, I usually go with Pembro Lenvatinib here. And then in the patient that you've mentioned with CABO, did they have bone mats? Because we've seen a little more strong data with CABO and bone mats. That's so interesting. So I, not this patient, but a different patient um, with bony metastases, I reached out to, uh, Raina McKay has done a lot of work in bone mats and CABO. And I'm not sure at the end she or the rest of us are convinced that CABO is truly more active in that space. Obviously, CABO has a history believe it or not, in prostate cancer back in the day where it was a bone met drug. And I think that sort of aura is carried along with it. Um, but I think it's just a very, very good, very, very powerful TKI and bone meds are hard to treat. Um, and so I wouldn't fault anyone for Cabo Nevo in that space, but I don't think Len Pembro is, is any different necessarily in bone met patients. Thank you for walking us through. Dr. Plumak, the other thing that we struggle in community practice ends up being, is there any role of nephrectomy in metastatic settings and any role of NGS upfront in RCC? Two excellent questions we get all the time. I'll answer the second one first. The short answer is no. Um, we don't routinely order NGS. There isn't anything yet that's actionable. It's, of course, interesting and fascinating, and lots of work is being done on that, but nothing clinically actionable right now. The second or first question that you asked was, is there any scenario where someone with metastatic disease, you would recommend a cytoreductive nephrectomy? So you're alluding to the fact that we used to do this as standard of care before the Carmina trial showed that it's better to start with systemic therapy than to start with surgery um, in patients with metastatic disease. And so let me just pull this up again. Um, we, we typically don't recommend it. 
There are always scenarios, and this is a common tumor board question, for instance, where someone has very small volume metastatic disease and a very large symptomatic renal mass, that patient should undergo resection. Um, but generally, I tell my fellows to, to consider it more of a palliative move. You're trying to remove the bulk of a tumor that could bleed, could cause problems, maybe causing symptoms, rather than truly therapeutic, because the best therapeutic move is to get started on systemic therapy. The other thing is that surgery requires a delay in systemic therapy because uh, incision healing, wound healing, angiogenesis is blocked by the um, VEGF inhibitors that we tend to use frontline. And so that's something to consider as well. So I would say rarely do we remove primary tumors in patients with metastatic disease. Thanks for those thoughts, Dr. Plymack. Now, also uh, recently we saw an approach with COSMIC 313 with a triplet combination. Your thoughts right. on that approach at all? Yeah, so the triplet combination, um, I'm just not totally clear that we're really adding to that. Um, again, triplet triples the potential toxicity as well. And so I think the jury's out as whether the benefit that was shown there in terms of both short-term and emerging long-term results really warrant using all through agent, three agents up front. So the, the short answer is it's a great trial. I'm glad it was done. It you know was positive for the endpoint we we're looking for, which was disease-free survival. Again, we expected that, but the more durable long-term endpoints are arguably more relevant in these um triplet combinations where you're losing using things up front that then you don't necessarily have to use later. So you need them to also work for longer. Um, so that's how I would sort of frame frame the triplet. I haven't seen it used very much in clinical practice at this point in time. And then of course, more side effects with triplet that we have to continue to worry about. That you have to both worry about and then parse out sort of the contribution of each, right? I'm especially worried about the um, immuno immune-related adverse events, because a lot of those box patients out of any subsequent immunotherapy that they might benefit from. So the high rate there, I think, was was more concerning. The TKIs, we can manage a little bit better. And talking about subsequent therapy, even here, what we have in second line, none of these studies except tevazinib was done after exposure of IO. And even with tevazinib, the benefit is modest at its mm -hmm. best. There's no yeah. OS, it was PFS benefit. Right. To summarize, we have optional pembrolizumab in adjuvant setting, though pending OS data. On the other hand, we have seen multiple combination approvals recently in first-line metastatic setting, but the data to support good treatment options thereafter is limited. Dr. Playmack, thank you so much for taking the time to review this algorithm with us and reiterating the current standard of care practice. Thank you so much for having me. This was a great discussion. Thank you.